Hey guys, welcome to another video here at Bringspark.com. Today I'm here with someone that I've known for years and that I was really looking forward to getting on here. His name is Jamie Smart and he's the author of the best-selling book Clarity. I cannot recommend this book enough. Go check it out. You can get it from Amazon or wherever. And um, Jamie has basically revolutionized the way a lot of the coaches that I know and work with do their thing and he's definitely influenced my own coaching and my own teaching a lot not to mention my life so I'm really excited to have him here I'm really excited to uh, see what we end up talking about and and bring his message uh, to you so you can see what what he has to offer now if you're a coach or a trainer or whatever you really should head over to jamiesmart.com and check out his website because he has a lot of stuff for you and even if you're not a coach or a trainer you're gonna find a lot of valuable stuff over there so, uh, you know, enough about me. Let's get to the main attraction. Jamie, thank you so much for being here today. Hey, it's great to be here, TJ. Uh, yeah, re I'm really curious to find out what we, what we end up talking about. It's great. Exactly. And it's, it's, to me, this is a conversation that I've looked forward to for a while because it seems to me that every time you and I meet and we talk, we might start out talking about one thing and we end up in a completely different topic and it's just so exciting at least for me all along the way that it just kind of it feels like one of those things that more people should be a part of and mm. so i'm glad we could do that uh through this this video yeah well me too because because it always ends up you know i end up learning something new you end up learning something new so hopefully the people who are uh who are tuning in here you know you're gonna learn something new too absolutely so why don't we start out with you talking about uh, clarity, not necessarily the book, but the, the message in it. Like, can you kind of, for those who don't know what it's about, can you kind of sum it up for them? Yeah, yeah. Well, so, so the headline is to get, give you a little background, to get, give you an idea of what I'm pointing to in the book. You know, in the old days, they didn't know about germs and bacteria. And the discovery of germs and bacteria in the 1800s. Uh, was a huge revolution. Now it took 50 or 60 years from the first point of discovery till everyone knew about it. But that discovery has added 30 years on average to the life of everyone on the planet. It's like done, like I, I don't know about you TJ, but I wouldn't even be here today if it wasn't for the discovery of germs and bacteria because I would have died of one of the illnesses I had when I was a kid or whatever. Exactly. So. So the discovery of a pre-existing fact of life, something that was already true, but that wasn't obvious to anyone, once that was discovered and once people were made aware of it, that had profound implications, you know, added 30 years to our lives, you know, so many, literally millions and millions of people are here today and healthy today that wouldn't have been if it wasn't for that discovery. Mm -hmm. Well. This will, may sound grandiose, but what I'm pointing to in clarity is to human psychology what the discovery of germs and bacteria was for, uh, for physical well-being. So the, the principles behind clarity are a pre-existing fact of life about how our psychology works, just like the discovery of germs and bacteria is a pre-existing fact about life, about how uh, physical health works. And when people get eyes for the principles behind clarity, their psychological well-being starts to improve radically, their relationships start improving, their productivity starts improving, their inner sense of security and well-being and lack of neediness starts improving. It just, it's sort of like, like if you imagine if someone had all in, back in the 1800s, they had all kinds of colds and you know sores and all kinds of whatever. I can't imagine how awful it was back then, but it was bad. You teach them about germs and bacteria, and they just start getting better. Then you discover penicillin, give them some penicillin, boom, all the infections go. It takes care of everything. Well, the principles behind clarity, they're kind of like penicillin for your mind. You catch on to this understanding and it, it, it goes everywhere and it starts showing up where you need it and when you need it and before you know it you're living a different kind of life so in a nutshell and we can dive into all that stuff and look at what do I mean by getting eyes for it and that sort of thing but in a nutshell the principles behind clarity are to human psychology what the discovery of germs and bacteria was to uh, 
to the field of medicine. Right. And, and so what I've seen with a lot of the people who's embraced the, these principles and are working with them is that they tend to change, especially like coaches and trainers, they tend to change their approach from being uh, technique based to more of a, a I don't want to call it a philosophical base, but more of a, a cognitive type type approach where instead of giving people techniques to improve something, they give them an understanding for why the, you know, the case is whatever the case might be. And through that realization, they tend to, uh, like you say, shed all these, these ideas of, of what's wrong and where their, you know, emotions or stress or whatever, where it's really coming from. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, so I was just wondering, like, because you were talking about, you know, the principles behind clarity, um, what are they? Well, so the principles behind clarity are a, like an explanation for your natural ability to learn, to evolve, to think, to perceive, to feel, our natural ability to have an experience of life. So when I say principles, I'm not talking about like, I don't know, the principles of building a good house are, well, make sure you dig a strong foundation, uh, use something strong to make it out of like bricks or wood, uh, make, sure you, make sure you put the walls up before you try to do the wiring and before you try to paint it, uh, make sure that all your load, so those are, those are good ideas, probably learned by, you know, tried and tested trial and error over, over a long period of time to figure out how to do something. So those are tips techniques, good ideas. I'm talking about a different kind of principle. I'm talking about principles like gravity as a principle. So just to give you an idea, um, gravity, when, when a kid's first born, uh, they don't really know much about gravity, if anything. There's nothing at all, but gravity is a fact of life. Like you're born into gravity and you're in it your whole life. Well, in the first weeks and months of life in the first few years of life we go on a learning curve because the thing about gravity number one it's a pre-existing fact of life but number two it's really obvious like you can't see it but you can't miss it either like any gravity works all the time so anything that you're doing that involves gravity and when you're a little kid almost everything involves gravity anything you're doing you're gonna get instant feedback from the fact of gravity about how you're doing that. So little kids without any instruction, they start learning about gravity automatically. It's an automatic learning curve. Now I, I was talking to a neuroscientist about this and she said, well, we have a name for that in psychology. It's called statistical learning. And what that means is learning automatically from data. So the data about the world that flows in automatically teaches you. And so we learn about gravity like that. We learn, a, we learn language like that. We learn like, no one sat down and said, okay, TJ, now I'm going to teach you how to say dog or how to say, no, you did it through data. You noticed how pe other people used it and you created language mm -hmm. from within you. Now, here's where it starts to get very interesting. So pre-existing existing fact of life, gravity, it's obvious. So you start learning automatically. Now take germs and bacteria. Well, germs and bacteria, they're a pre-existing fact of life. They're, they're there everywhere, but they're not obvious. Like, if no one told you about them, you could go your whole life without ever even knowing they existed. And in fact, until the 1800s, the smartest people in the whole world went their whole life without even knowing that this fact of life existed. So if you want to teach kids about germs and bacteria, you got to give them eyes for it because it is a pre-existing fact of life, but it's not obvious. It's not obvious. So, oh man, I, I heard this story the other day. I was talking to one of my clients. She's out in Singapore and she's got little kids and they were at school learning about germs and bacteria. So the teacher goes to them. Now today we're going to learn about germs and bacteria and she takes two of the little kids and she puts glitter all over them. You know that glitter that kids, she puts glitter all over these two kids. And then she said, let's check at the end of the day and see what's happened to the, the glitter. Well, at the end of the day, all these kids are clever, covered in glitter. And then the teacher goes, that's what germs and bacteria are like. 
boom, the kids have got eyes for germs and bacteria, That's for how they're... So now, so here's the cool thing, like I immediately fell in love with this teacher, of course, but those kids will now go on an automatic learning curve because they have, they have a, a they, they have a basis for learning about something that's already true. Now, you, if you think about gravity again, your, you've used, TJ, you've used your embodied understanding of gravity. Gravity, your understanding of gravity isn't some idea about theories. You use it every time you walk up a flight of stairs, every time you pick something up, every time you do something. You're using your embodied understanding. You're, you're using it automatically. You don't even have to think about it. Same with germs and bacteria. You've been on a learning curve about germs and bacteria because some teacher or some parent once gave you eyes for it and you started learning automatically about this pre-existing fact of life. Well, the principles behind clarity are as much a pre-existing fact of life as gravity, as germs and bacteria. They're, they're as already true as any of those things. But like germs and bacteria, they're not obvious. So my job is to help people get eyes for something that's already true about their life so that they can go on that automatic learning curve. And as soon as that automatic learning curve gets triggered, it starts taking things off their mind because it turns out that most of the things people struggle with, most of the places where people have difficulties and get stuck, most of the places where people aren't bringing their best game are places where they're stuck in a misunderstanding about where their experience is coming from. And that's, that to me was one of the most interesting things. I mean, I've seen you teach this uh, to plenty of people and talk about these things. And as soon as you get to this point where, where that, you know, uh, misunderstanding of where their experience is coming from and, and people uh, understand it, people, you know, get clarity on it, if you will. There's so many people who have these huge reactions to it. And that to me is just so much fun to watch because you, you get the people, they're, they're, they look like they're thinking and then suddenly the piece falls into place and they, you know, some of them go, holy shit, and yeah. <laughs> literally calling it out. And it's, it's so cool because you can see the exact moment that insight hits them. Uh, others, you know, of course, don't have that huge reaction, but you can always see the reaction. And, uh, and, you know, I've seen friends of mine have that, um, and it's just great fun to watch from the outside, you know, already having, uh, you know, read your book and, and talk to you so much that I understand where this is coming from. Mm. But how do you, how do you kind of work with these people to get them, get them to that point? Oh, great question. So, so the main ways that I work with people is either short talk, you know, large, large group of people or a smaller, more intimate workshop, maybe, you know, uh, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 people uh, in, a, in a group and working with them over a longer period of time, maybe a few days or a few, you know, my, my coach training programs, they run for a whole year. Or I work one-to-one -one with people. And when I'm working one-to-one -one with people, often my starting point is to actually go away with them one-on-one -on -one for three days just to create a, like in all these situations, what I'm looking to do is create a context, create a space where people fall out of their habitual misunderstanding of life and fall into the moment. They fall out of their thinking and into the moment. And when they fall out of their thinking and into the moment, they tend to be more relaxed, more connected with themselves and with me and with life and more reflective and uh, a little more peaceful and that sort of thing. And when they're in that space, you know, there's this, this question I'll often ask when I'm, I'm talking to groups. I, I was, uh, last month I was doing a talk to uh, the uh, Greenwich University Business School here in London. And so I've got all these business students and professors and that sort of thing. And one of the questions I asked them was, when do you get your best ideas? 
Now, I've asked groups this question literally hundreds of times, over and over again, all over the world, all over all different organizations, different areas. And I ask the question, when do you get your best ideas? And almost without exception, the answers are along the lines of when I'm out for a walk, when I'm in the shower or in the bath, when I'm just about to drop off to sleep or when I'm just lying in bed in the morning, uh, when I'm on holiday, when I'm traveling to and from work, when I'm on an airplane flight, when, uh, when I'm playing a sport or doing, you know, when I'm doing, when I'm cleaning up the kitchen, when, you know, it's people almost never say, I get my best ideas when I'm really thinking hard about it. They always say they get their best ideas either when they're doing something else or when they're doing nothing at all. Well, so when we're not thinking about the thing we want, we want to fix or change or achieve or get help with, when we're not thinking about it, that's when we've got our best shot at getting the fresh, new, insightful information that's going to make a difference to us. But unfortunately, most of us, when we've got something where we're struggling or we want to change it or fix it, we try and think more about it. And then maybe we go to a coach and they get us to think about it in different ways. Well, my, my basic premise with, with groups and individuals is I want to create a space where they become insight prone, where they become very, very available to getting those light bulb moments and those fresh new thinking. And the way that I've found is very, very helpful for doing that is to use uh, stories and exercises and uh, this more kind of what we might call this more kind of philosophical exploration. See, the thing is, when people are struggling with something or they got something they're really trying to achieve and they're not working, it's like if, if they're, how they're perceiving the problem, like it's always how they're perceiving it that's the issue. It's not the real world that's the issue. It's their perception. But when they're really into it, it's like it's right there. It's kind of like, it's like, it's like well, uh, how could you think about that differently? It's like, well, what do you mean think about it differently? I'm, 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 can you, well, I guess I could work harder at it. Or, and so I want to kind of, I want to kind of change the subject. So they're kind of, I want, I want to get it like, so they're looking somewhere else. They're looking somewhere that's interesting and engaging and, and involving, but that isn't looking at that. And I get them looking in this more philosophical direction long enough that they start to kind of quiet down on the inside and get more peaceful and, and reflective. And because we're pointing in the direction of something that's already true for everyone, like it's, that's the thing about principles, TJ, is they're already, they're, when, when you're talking about a, a fact of life about how life already works, it's how it already works for everyone. And so it's not personal. Like if we're talking about, how, if we were doing a class for people, I don't know why we'd do this, but a class on how gravity works. And someone might say, well, I don't like that if someone's really nice and they get pushed off a cliff, doesn't matter how nice they are, gravity still, still throws them down to the ground. It's like, well, with gravity, it's not personal. It's not personal. It works the same for a Nobel Prize winner as it does for a sea pirate. It's, it's the same for everyone. It's the same for everyone. Well, you know, or they go, oh, well, I don't think it's fair that, you know, my great grandmother, she was a really good person, worked hard her whole life, but she got a cut on her hand and got an infection and died from it. There's no justice. It's like, well, germs and bacteria don't check your, your personal history before they decide what to do. They're, they're in, it's impersonal. So as people see, we've never really been pointed in the direction that there are impersonal facts of life that play out for us all, that they're, and they work the same for everyone. And as people start to look in the direction of something that's true for everyone, it starts to trigger that learning curve. People start to get insights. And that's why you see people starting to go pop, poppity pop, and right. 
and yeah, because it, it seems to me because um, you know I get a lot of this where people talk about how life's not fair and and all this stuff, but like you said, it's it's impersonal. It's you know what happens is neutral. It's not you know. Uh, fair or unfair, it's just that's just what happens based on you know whatever the the you know germs or, or gravity or whatever, um, and sometimes it's chance, sometimes it's bad luck, but it's not even that because it's more a question of accepting that whatever happens is not you know your fault, it's not anyone's fault, it's just what happens. The world out there is is neutral, and. The only thing that decides whether it's fair or not is our perception of it, like you said. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. So um, I want to return to to that because you said uh, a few minutes ago you talked about the misunderstanding of where things are coming from, and I feel like you know we're getting we're zoning in on that right now. Yeah. Uh, it feels like to me. So so can you explain what that misunderstanding is? Oh yeah, I'd love to. So so. Um... In a nutshell, I'll say it. I'm going to say it very precisely, and then and then we're going to talk about it. Mm -hmm. So, in a nutshell, the misunderstanding, and I refer to this misunderstanding as the outside-in misunderstanding. So, I'm going to explain what I mean by that. The outside-in misunderstanding is the mistaken belief that our feelings are letting us know about something other than the principle of thought taking form in the moment. Now, what the hell does that mean? I'm gonna, I'm gonna dive into it, because that's, it's kind of a cumbersome way of saying it, but it's the, the best way I've found to say it that is still precise and accurate in what I'm pointing to. So, the outside of misunderstanding is the mistaken belief that we're feeling something other than the principle of thought taking form in the moment. So, I, I'm gonna, Start by using a metaphor, like if, if, uh, if, if you, when you were a little kid, I don't know, did you ever have like a security blanket or a teddy bear or? Oh yeah, uh, I had two like... teddy bears, I actually still have them. Today. Oh, okay. Now, are they with you right now or are they in the other No, room? They're, they're at my parents' house. Oh, okay. Well now, this, see, this is interesting. I bet when you were a little kid, if you were in one place and you'd left your teddy bears somewhere else over a long period of time, you would have got quite distressed by it. Mm -hmm. Because with little kids, when, when they have like a security blanket or a teddy bear or whatever it might be, it really seems, like it really seems to that kid like their feelings of comfort and security and well-being are coming from that bear or that blanket. And they genuinely, like they're not, mess and they 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 genuinely like, like they get their bear and they feel a sense of security and comfort and peace and it seems absolutely like that some of that's got something to do with the bear and if if they go away somewhere and their parents leave the bear at home the kid often freaks out because it's like their source of peace and comfort and well-being has been left in the other house it's like oh my god but you seem really relaxed even though your bears are at your parents house well that's, that's because you've woken up to the fact that that was a trick of the mind. See, the, when, when kids believe that their feelings of security and well-being are coming from the bear or the blanket or whatever, they've been tricked by their parents. I, I don't mean in a horrible way. That it's a kind of a nice trick to play. They've been tricked uh, into believing that their feelings are coming from out there that there's some way that that bear is causing the feelings. But if you opened up the bear, you'll find there's no feeling transmitter in the bear. It, it doesn't work that way. It's 100% a trick of the mind. The, the child has feelings of comfort and security and well-being as a function of their birthright. That, we all have that core of peace and well-being and security within us. And the only thing that ever gets in the way of it is what I call contaminated thinking, which is thinking that, that is sponsored by the outside in misunderstanding, the mistaken belief that we're feeling something other than our thinking. So the kid is feeling 
feeling peace and comfort and well-being and they believe that's coming from the bear well that's a misunderstanding and then you drive away without the bear on holiday and the kid starts freaking out well that's a misunderstanding too the kid believes that the feelings of freak out are letting them know about the bear but those feelings of freak out are letting them know they've got freaked out thinking in that moment that the principle of thought has taken a freaked out form now here's the thing TJ We've all been conditioned into this misunderstanding. So it's easy, it's very easy to look at the child's teddy bear and go, oh, yes, well, I understand that that's a trick of the mind and that none of the child's security is really coming from the bear. It's actually coming from within them and they're just assigning it to the bear. But me, I have a job and a mortgage and a wife and a car and a, a reputation and goals and an award from the Chamber of Commerce some of my feelings of security and approval and successfulness are coming from my possessions and my bank account and my future security and my past accomplishments and uh, the people and what in my life and what they think of me. But that is exactly the same trick of the mind. It's a trick of the mind. It's absolutely not true. A hundred percent of your feelings of security, approval, well-being, 100% of those feelings are arising from within you. They're, they're a reflection of the principle of thought taking form in the moment. And 0% of those feelings have anything to do with anything outside of you. And this is, uh, to me, this was the most interesting thing when I, when I was starting to learn about your, your principles of clarity. And, uh, you know, I've, I've brought that with me into my own coaching. And uh, I, I remember I was teaching a workshop about six months ago. And we were talking about this stuff. And then we, we took a break and we went out to lunch. And as we we're sitting around the table, one of the guys went, so are you trying to tell me that, you know, if, if someone makes me upset, then that's not their fault. But it's I'm actually the one making myself upset. And I said, yeah, that's, you know, kind of a way to, to sum it up. And he was like, well, I disagree. And I went, okay, so there's like four of us. And I said, so if I take this, well, it wasn't, it was water. But if I take this glass of water and I throw it at you right now here at the restaurant, is that going to piss you off? And he said, yeah, obviously everyone would get pissed off if you did that out of the blue. And so I looked at the other guys and I said, how about you? And I point to one of the other guys and he thought about it and he said, I think I'd feel really insecure and wonder why you did that. And I went, so there's no anger, there's more... You know, he was not probably more, you know, fright or, or nervousness. I looked at one of the other guys and he was already smiling, you know, and so what would you think? How would you react to that? And he said, I'd probably throw my water at you and we'd have a food fight and, you know, it could be fun. And so just in that, we had three different interpretations of the same action and three different emotions. Mm -hmm. And to the, the guy that was objecting to it, he, he kind of needed this to sink in for a bit. And... To me, though, it was a fun real life example of how we tend to like people saying that, you know, warm weather and sun always puts them in a good mood and the rain mm. and the snow always makes them, you know, feel miserable. I was one. Of, I am one of them. I, I love I love it when it's hot out when, you know, in the summer with the sun out. But I also recognize that the reason why I feel good about it is, as you say, because of the thinking that I have about the sun and it's not a universal thing. Well, you know, I'd, I might go even a little bit further, and, and I'm going to make a prediction, and we'll see if I'm right in my prediction. That when it's hot and sunny, you're probably not thinking much about the sun. And when it's cold and miserable and overcast, you're thinking a lot about the weather. See, I'd suggest that the feelings of enjoyment and freedom and well-being that you notice and experience when it's hot and sunny, they're a function of the fact that you don't have much on your mind. And the feelings of whatever they might be, kind of a little maybe heavier or less happy about it or whatever that you have when it, the weather's not so good, that that's a function of all the thinking you've got on your mind. So what you're saying is that, um, you know, the good feelings that people get when, you know, that they often attribute to, to external factors isn't even related to that. It's just an effect of thinking less. Well, yes, but uh, I, can I 
I want to say this as precisely as I can because there's, it's very easy when we're looking at this stuff for people to hear it as, oh, okay, I need to get better thinking or I need to think less or oh, maybe I should go meditate or that sort of thing. So what I'm pointing to is something that's very, very simple but kind of subtle as well. It's subtle but profound. So is it okay if I kind of take the long way around in explaining this? Please. So to explain this, I want to start by talking a little bit about the principle of thought, what I mean by the principle of thought. So, you know, we've said gravity is a principle, and you can't see gravity. You can only register its effects. You can notice its effects. You can feel its effects. You can measure its effects, but you can't see gravity. Gravity is invisible. It's invisible, but you can see its effects. Well, the principle of thought, like the principle of gravity, is invisible, but you can experience its effects. So just like you're born into gravity, you're born into thought. You're born into the principle of thought. And what I'm calling the principle of thought is what literally creates our picture of life. So I'm going to give you another metaphor. If, if, if you're watching this on a computer or a phone or a TV screen, it looks like you can, you know, uh, see our faces and that sort of thing. But what you're actually seeing is pixels. But the pixels are so well, uh, the, the, the illusion that those pixels create is so compelling that until I mentioned it, it probably seemed like you're actually having an interaction with us. But you're not. You're having an interaction with a digitally recreated representation of us, represented by the pixels on your screen. Well, and if you, you know, go and watch a YouTube video or open your email or uh, uh, look through some photos on the screen or whatever, all of those things are created of pixels as well. And the illusion that the pixels create is so deceptive and so compelling that until I mention it, you probably forget that it's an illusion and res relate to that stuff to some degree as though it's a reality. Now, you know the, natures, uh, the nature of pictures and videos and stuff, so you don't actually believe that uh, there are tiny people inside your computer, I'm guessing, but, but still it kind of, it, it's like you're, relating to an actual person. I've even had the thing, you ever had the thing where you're listening to a phone message that someone's left for you and maybe you're a little bit distracted and you forget that it's a message and you answer something or reply to something they've said and then you remember it's a message? Yeah. Well, you weren't listening to them. You are listening to a representation, but a representation that's so faithful and so functional and practical and accurate that you can be tricked into relating to it as though it's an actual reality. Well, that's what happens when we go to a movie as well. Like a, a movie director, the movie director's job is to fool us into believing that the images on the screen are an actual reality. But, and, and if we enjoy a movie, if it's a good movie, then, then we go through this oscillation of getting swept away by the movie and falling into the illusion and then waking up from it and realizing we're in a theater or we're sitting on our sofa and then we get swept away and into the reality of the movie again and then we wake up and remember and for a good movie it's both of those for a movie you don't enjoy that you can't get into you're just sitting on your sofa watching light on a screen for a movie that is terrifying you're not falling out of it you're totally caught up in it well when I talk about the principle of thought, thought is the best movie maker in the world. So when you wake up in a thought-generated perceptual reality, you don't even realize thought's got anything to do with it. It just looks like reality. Like, look around wherever you are right now. I'm not saying you're not in a room or a house or wherever it is you happen to be. I'm sure you are. 
but a hundred percent of your experience of that place is being generated from within you using the principle of thought. Thought is creating that picture of the world. Now, it looks like we're looking out through holes in our heads at a reality that's out there. And for practical purposes, we are, you know, your models of reality are well calibrated with your world and that's why you can function in the world. But the fact of the matter is that everything you can see and everything you can hear and everything you can taste and smell and feel, everything you can perceive is a virtual projection that's being generated from within your psychological and neurological properties. And that is the most extraordinary and shocking and breathtaking thing I've ever seen. And it's old neurology. They figured that out in the 1850s. Yeah. Yeah. And yet for most people, most people are like, no, that's not true because it looks so real. And even most people, like people who I'm teaching who are studying this stuff, they go, oh, yeah, yeah, no, I know that. And they don't. They don't because when you know that, it kind of takes your breath away when you see that. And I don't, I don't know it most of the time. And then I talk about it and I'm like, oh, really? Really? It's sort of like, like people used to think that the sun went around the earth, but it never worked that way, not even for a minute. But it sure looks like that's how it works. That's how it looks where I live. And, and so for practical purposes, I behave as though the earth is still and the sun's the one that's moving. That's not what's going on. Well, when it comes to our perception, for practical purposes, we can behave as though we're in a world that's out there and that's why we've got these you know, functional models that we work with. But the more you understand how it actually works, what's really going on, then something pretty incredible starts to happen because what you start to realize is that it's not possible to predict how someone's going to feel about any set of circumstances. All circumstances are neutral and we live in a thought-generated perceptual reality. So we're going to experience a circumstance one way or another. But that's to some extent a roll of the dice. And as you start to see that, the truth of it starts to become clear, which is that you can never be a victim of circumstance. It's not possible. It's not possible for you to be a victim of circumstance because there's no circumstance that can be guaranteed to make you feel any particular way. You can, you can think you're a victim of circumstance and then you'll feel like you're a victim of circumstance, but you can't actually be a victim of circumstance. Just like you can think the sun goes around the earth. You, that doesn't actually mean the sun does go around the earth. It's not possible for you to be a victim of circumstance. Mm -hmm. so, so I have um, an experience that it took me years to, to fully understand what it was. And I, you know, it's, it's, it speaks to this, this uh, fact that you were just talking about how we, you know, create the perception of what's going on around us ourselves. And I was uh, 18. I was living in Florida at the time. I was an exchange student there. And my family came to visit and we went to Disney World because my little sister was 11. So it seemed like a good idea. Now, my mom hates roller coasters. Like that's her worst thing ever. She just hates them. They're not safe. She's, you know, always complaining about them whenever they come up. I love them. My dad loves them. My sister loves them. So we're walking around Disney World and, and obviously my mom didn't want to go on any of the rides. But then there's a ride there called Space Mountain. And I don't know if you've been to Space Mountain, but it's an indoor roller coaster. So yes. you can't actually see it. It's inside a building. And not only that, but it's pitch dark in there. Like they have like fake stars. So it, it feels like you're doing a roller coaster among the stars and you can't see the track. You have no idea where the next turn or drops coming from. And you know, I love stuff like that. Uh. And I told my mom, 
you know, let's go do this roller or this this ride because it's a nice one. And she was like, no, she didn't really. Do <laughs> it's and a I, nice you know, one. <laughs> yeah. And, and being mean as I am at times, I pointed out, well, look at all the kids in line. Come on. They wouldn't let the kids on there if it was dangerous. It's inside a building. How big can it be? It's a huge building. But yeah. <laughs> and so finally I talk her into it. And we get on the roller coaster and she's next to me and we're doing it and I'm loving every second of it. First of all, you know, I think the roller coaster is fun, but also it's kind of fun to know that my mom is, is scared and pissed off at me because I tricked her to doing that ride. Now, you know, objectively speaking, we had the exact same experience at the exact same time. We were sitting next to each other, you know, the same drops, same temperature, the same sounds. Everything was completely identical for both of us. But getting off the, the ride, you know, she had a completely different experience of it than I did. To her, that was no fun. It was, you know, upsetting. It was scary. It was, you know, it made her angry at me and, and my dad for tricking her to go on there. But for me, it was, it was fun. And I, I talked about that experience for a long time because I always understood that, you know, it was a difference of, of, are thinking about it that kind of created these different types of experiences. But to me, once I kind of fully understood, or at least I think I do, uh, the principles that you're talking about, it kind of became obvious to me that I could take that experience and realize that whatever I was feeling or experiencing in my life at any time, whether it was, you know, another person or the weather or an activity I was doing, or whatever it was, could be attributed to that same phenomenon and it's just that experience made it so clear to me mm. way before i actually thought about any of this stuff and then later when i started to realize how it worked to me that's just one of the whenever i'm in doubt or whenever i feel myself getting caught up in that misunderstanding that's usually the story that i go to in my mind just to, yeah. to show it to myself that you know it's, that's actually how it works yeah well and here's my guess tj my guess is when you took that ride, you weren't thinking about much. My guess is that your mom was thinking a lot. Probably. And now, I, I love roller coasters as well. Uh, one of the things about roller coasters is there are all kinds of sensations and, you know, that sort of thing. My guess is that your mom had sensations of fear and anxiety and that sort of thing. And she believed that that had something to do with the, uh, the situation she was in, right. that those feelings were coming from how dangerous her situation was, when in reality, her feelings were letting her know she had terrifying thinking in that moment. Mm -hmm. And I know for me, I remember the first time as an adult that I got on a roller coaster. I had lots of thinking beforehand. I was like, oh, this is so boring. This is what kids do. This is, God, how am I spending my day doing this stupid stuff? Da, 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 da. So I was, I was actually like, I was Oscar the Grouch. I was like, uh, I was being really, I was really being a dick, actually. I was taking my sister on a roller coaster. I'm like, uh, 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 uh. we go on the roller coaster. Suddenly my head clears and I'm like almost crying with joy crying with joy well before we got on the roller coaster all my thinking about was me and me and what's going on and what i'm doing and this isn't what i want to be doing today go on the roller coaster i fall out of that thinking and into the present moment and what i find again and again and again and again you fall into the present moment and you're going to start having a rich experience of life. And everywhere that people struggle, they're caught up in their personal thinking. Am I thinking about me and what I like and what I don't like and what's going to happen? And what da, da. the moment I fall out of my concepts and my ideas and my beliefs and fall into the present moment, you find that life is rich and fulfilling and satisfying. You find that you have what you need to do what you need to do. And so coming back to the weather analogy, my guess is that without painting the picture too vividly, when it's, when it's crummy weather and you're thinking about it, you're like, oh, I don't like crummy weather. I'm not the sort of person who likes crummy weather. I wish I was in LA where the weather's good. And when it's nice weather, you're just not thinking about it that much. And so you experience the 
freshness and the vibrancy and the fulfillment and enjoyment of life that comes when you've got a free and clear mind. Now, here's the interesting thing. I, I took my youngest daughter, Tallulah, uh, for, you know, it was so, so cool. So uh, Tallulah's pr still pretty small. She's 11 years old. And our local roller coaster park is, is called Alton Towers. And you've got to be a certain height before you can go there. And so she, I mean, you can go on the little kids rides, but you can't go on the grown up rides. And she really wanted to go to Alton Towers. Like for years she's wanted to go, but she's like, I'm not going till I can go on the grown up rides. So she's like, she's like, so this year we get close to her birthday and she's tall enough. So she and I go to Alton Towers. So we go there and the first roller coaster we go on is called air and in air they strap you into it so you're like in a flying position in a superman position and then you go through like loops and corkscrews and all this stuff in a in a flying position so we're in the lineup for the roller coaster and it's it's you know probably 20 minutes of lineup and Tallulah she's like one minute she's excited the next minute she's scared and she's thinking i don't want to go on it the next minute she's really looking forward to it. she's just going through the whole range of human emotions everything from i can't believe we're here now to i uh, please take me take me home it's she's going through the whole she's literally going through a roller coaster of emotions in her mind so finally we get to the front of the line and we get on the roller coaster and they put us in we go on the roller coaster and she's just like having the best time. We get off the roller coaster at the end of it. I say, how was that? She goes, well, that was amazing. She goes, but, but I, she goes, that's probably the most fun I've ever had in my life. But there's something I don't understand. I said, what's that? She said, well, when we were in the lineup, I was really scared for some of the time. And I even thought about not going on the roller coaster. But when I was on the roller coaster, I wasn't scared at all. I really enjoyed it. And I said to her, well, what do you make of that? And she thought about it. She said, well, I guess when I was in the lineup, I was feeling my thinking. But I believed I was feeling what the roller coaster was going to be like. I said, you got it, kid. That's exactly what it was. One smart kid you got there, huh? I guess, huh? <laughs> so I said to her, I said, listen, throughout your whole life, you're going to get into situations where you or the people you're with are in the lineup, but they believe they're feeling the ride, but actually they're just feeling that thinking. And the moment you see that, you're going to fall back into the moment and be available to life because when you are on the roller coaster, you weren't thinking about it. You were there. You were having the experience. And TJC, it turns out that life is kind of like that roller coaster. See, that roller coaster is perfectly safe. And it's exciting and thrilling and all that sort of stuff. But people don't realize that. They think that it's dangerous and that they've got a lot to lose. And the reason they think that is because they've been conditioned into believing that their feelings are coming from somewhere other than the principle of thought arising in the moment. It's moment to moment to moment. Your mom, when she was on that roller coaster, it seemed to her like her feelings were coming from somewhere other than the principle of thought in the moment. It seemed like there was more to it than that. She was feeling freaked out and she was thinking, well, there's no smoke without fire. There must be a dangerous roller coaster here. And I'm saying there is smoke without fire. Thought is the best movie maker in the world. You know, we've all had that where we're all freaked out about something, about some problem or some issue, and we go to sleep and we wake up the next morning and we're like, why was I so freaked out about it? Yeah, the night before it sure seemed like, hey, there's no smoke without fire. I wouldn't be feeling so freaked out if it wasn't a real problem. Oh, yeah. You <laughs> As you might have mentioned or noticed, I like to be mean every now and then. I think it's fun to mess with people. And one of the things that I do that I feel is a perfect example of how much we can scare ourselves just by, by our imagination, basically, is I, I love watching horror movies. And I love watching horror movies with people who don't like to watch horror movies. It's great fun for me. And I mean, I get scared from the movie too, if it's a good one. But um, 
It's just something, I like the kick, I like the adrenaline rush and all that. And uh, whenever I watch a movie with friends of mine, especially female friends of mine, and then they head home after the movie, I usually tell them, text me once they're home and in bed so I know that they're safe and, you know, can wish them a good night. Which seems like a very cute thing to do. But what I do is when they text me and say, you know, I'm in bed, sleep tight, thanks for a good time tonight, I'll wait for a couple of minutes and until I'm assuming that they're, you know, under the covers, maybe lights off, and then I'll text them back and I'll say, you know, sleep tight and don't worry about the guy watching you from the corner. And they get pissed off, obviously, because they get scared because yeah. they're in a dark room and they just look for the darkest corner and they're imagining that someone's there. And just by the power of their own thoughts and, you know, creating that movie that you were talking about in their minds, now they're convinced that there's someone there. And I've had them call me up and yell at me because they're now in bed and they're too scared to go turn on the lights. You're a very evil man, TJ. I know, I can be. <laughs> uh, but it's a fun thing. And, and to me, it's, it's a good example of, of how much power your thoughts have over your, your perception of reality in, in whatever moment you're in. Well, and here's the interesting thing. The issue that those women experience when that happens isn't the issue isn't that they have fearful feelings arising from fearful thinking that's not an issue we're all subject to that that's not the issue the issue is they believe there's more to those fearful feelings than they're thinking thinking well i wouldn't be frightened if there wasn't at least a slightly increased risk that there's someone they think there's more to it than that well that's what happens to all of us so you may have done this with me uh, at the workshop in oslo i get people to tap themselves on the head and so they're tapping themselves lightly on the head. And I say, well, now that's fine, isn't it? And they're like, yeah, they're not feeling threatened or bothered by it. And then I ask, what if someone else reached over and started tapping you on the head? And they're like, ooh, no, that's not good. Well, we intuitively get that there's a huge difference between something we're doing to ourselves and something someone else or something else is doing to us. Because if it's coming from out there, then... We feel under threat. Well, so the issue isn't that those women are frightening themselves with frightening thinking. No, no one's bothered by frightening themselves with frightening thinking. The issue is they believe there's more to it than that. That there's some, there's no smoke without fire. There must be, there must be some guy in there somewhere. Otherwise, otherwise I wouldn't be feeling this way. Well, I'm telling you, that's exactly what's going on. It's, it's the movie cinema in your head, and. The more you understand how that actually works, the more emotional freedom you're going to experience and the more peace and well-being and security you're going to enjoy in your life. And the more you're going to be able to create whatever you want in your experience. Right. And, and to me, that's interesting because we've been talking a lot about you know, your experience and everything. But I would like to, uh, as we get towards the end of our, our conversation, draw it down to something uh, practical. Because... You know, you're, I know that what you do isn't just about helping people to, to be more comfortable or be more relaxed, but you also help people, for example, perform better. I know yeah. you've had athletes using this method to, to perform better. So let's touch on that. And, and I know you do a lot more than just performance coaching. And sure. Stuff, but let's, let's use that as an example just to see, you know, how will understanding this principle allow you to perform better in like a sporting situation or Great. giving a presentation or whatever it is where you need to kind of be on your game. How does this yeah. help you do that? Well, let's, let's use presentations or public speaking as the example, just because it's such a universal for so many people. But what I'm going to say about public speaking and presentations applies to sports performance, musical performance, uh, having a good date with someone and just being present and connected and in the moment. It applies across all of those. Now, you're a comfortable, confident public speaker, TJ, uh, and, and so am I. And if we were talking to a group of people who are very uh, nervous public speakers or maybe even very afraid of public, of public speaking, if we ask them, what are you thinking about when you're on stage? They're going to say, oh, I'm thinking about making sure that my message is right, and what happens if I screw up and making sure that it's perfect and how do I look and they're thinking they've got a lot on their mind now I don't know that I've ever asked you this before but what are you thinking about when you're on stage nothing usually 
Yeah, okay. me neither. You're just. I'm just there. I'm just doing what I know I'm, you know, supposed to be doing. I'm just kind of free flowing with whatever seems right for me in the moment. Yeah, same here. And and I'm paying attention to the audience, noticing how they're responding to what I'm saying, and everyone I speak to who's a naturally good public speaker, that's how they do it. They they got very little on their mind. They're not thinking about it. They're connecting with their audience, they're uh, following their inspiration, but they're not up in their heads thinking about it. And, that, and it's the same with high performers uh, on the athletic field. Uh, it's the same uh, with when you're really enjoying a date or something like that. So, so the issue isn't what you're, the, the cool things you're thinking that are allowing you to be a great public speaker, it's the absence of having things on them on your mind that allow you to deliver a high performance. Um, so, the first question people ask is, "Well, okay, how do I take things off my mind?" And that's a great question, but it's the wrong question. The I, but it, here's the interesting thing: so, as human beings, we are suckers for positive advice. You know, what are the top five tips you can give me to take things off my mind so I can do a better performance? Now, here's the thing. The, you know, every Cosmopolitan magazine or Men's Health magazine or whatever has every single month the top seven things you need to do to get six-pack abs, the top 12 things you need, need to do to find the perfect woman or find the perfect man or uh, find your dream job or, uh, you know, be amazing in bed or whatever it is. And the thing about that positive advice, the top 10 tips is, A, they're instantly obvious. You're like, why didn't I think of that? That's what I should be doing. It's so obvious. And B, we forget about them within four minutes and don't do them. Because positive advice seems useful, but it's not what actually works. What actually works is what I call subtractive understanding. And the principles behind clarity are ruthlessly subtractive. So when I said, how do I get a clear mind is a natural question, but it's the wrong one. The right question is, what's getting in the way? What's putting stuff on your mind in the first place? Like if you imagine a river, beautiful glacial river pouring beautiful water down to the sea, that river, that's like how thought plays out in human beings. It's pouring beautiful, clean, flowing river. And in those times when you talk about like on beautiful days or on the roller coaster where you're really enjoying yourself, that's the flow of thought that we're in when we're enjoying ourselves and when we're performing well and that sort of thing. And if you look at really little kids, like three years old, four years old, they spend a lot of time in that flow that flow. They, now, they, they get upset and stuff. They get scared, that sort of thing. And they get really bothered, and then they're back into the flow. And they get really mad, and then they're back into the flow. They get really sad, and then they're back into the flow. So they self-correct very, very quickly. Now, if you look at adults, a lot of times, they don't spend much time in that flow. Their thinking is contaminated. And it's like a river that's got you know a sewage plant next to it pouring contaminated uh, sewage into it. And so then their question is, how do I clean up the river? And that's a great question. You know, what are your top five tips for cleaning up the river? Well, my top tip for cleaning up the river is shut down the sewage plant. Shut down the sewage plant. And so then the question is, well, what's the sewage plant? Well, the sewage plant is this misunderstanding that we've been conditioned into since we were children. There's a fundamental misunderstanding about where our experience come from that, that is as fundamental as the mistaken belief that the sun goes around the earth or the mistaken belief that illness and disease were caused by bad smells or the mistaken belief that planets and stars stay up in the sky because they're floating on celestial spheres made of glass. That was the best guess people had for understanding something that was not obvious, but they were wrong. They were just wrong. It just didn't work that way. And what I'm going to suggest to you is that anywhere where you're struggling in life, anywhere where you're preoccupied, where, anywhere where you've got a lot on your mind and aren't able to have the experiences you want to have and 
show up in the way that you want to show up. As strange as it may sound, those areas are places where you're up against a, just a basic misunderstanding of how life works that's as, as fundamental as believing that the sun's going around the earth. And here's the great news. To overcome the misunderstanding, when they believed that the earth, sun went around the earth, they didn't have to make it so that the earth went around the sun. The earth was already going around the sun. They just had to have an insight that brought their perceptions more closely in alignment with reality. And for you, the, to benefit from the realization that we live in an inside-out world, that we're living in the experience of the principle of thought taking form in the moment, you don't have to change how it works. It has never worked outside in. Every single painful, distressing, bothersome experience you've ever had that you thought came from outside of you was just a misunderstanding. It never worked that way. And every beautiful experience that you thought came from outside you, whether it's winning a lottery ticket or uh, getting a kiss from a beautiful stranger or whatever it might be, those beautiful feelings, they all came from within you. It only works one way. Yeah, I know it looks like it works the other way. It looks like it works the other way to me too, but that's, that's a, just a misunderstanding. It's an innocent trick of the mind that we all get hoodwinked by. But if you look in this direction and deepen your understanding of the principles behind clarity, you're going to start seeing through that misunderstanding. You're going to start shutting down the sewage plant. And you're going to start seeing that river of thought that's creating your experience running clear and pristine and beautiful. And you're going to get the performances and the rich experiences and the feelings of love and connection and well-being that go along with that, as well as brilliant new ideas that are going to help you out in the places where you need it. I, I can promise you that. You know, you stay in this conversation, you're going to see what you need to see. So I know that's a long answer to your question, but that's what I'd say to someone who's... Uh, that, was, uh, that was great. That was great. So, um, guys, we're going to start wrapping it up again. Get your copy of Clarity. Clear Mind, Better Performance, Bigger Results. Um, it's a great book. It's sold you know, tons of copies and it's well worth the read. There's also an audio book that you guys can get and uh, head over to jamiesmart.com to check out more of what Jamie does. You do one-on-one -on -one coachings as well as workshops and seminars, right? Yeah, yeah. There's, there's lots of free stuff there. One-on-one -on -one coaching, uh, coach training, uh, trainer training and, and open programs and workshops as well. It's perfect. All right, we're going to wrap it up. Thank you so much, Jamie. That was an amazingly good talk, and it's always a pleasure to, uh, to talk with you. And I hope to see you again soon, and hopefully we can get you on here uh, later, too. I look forward to that, TJ. Always a huge pleasure to speak with you. All right, thank you very much.